Okay, good afternoon, ladies, of the, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the media, ministers, um, to the public as well. I'd like to thank you for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Alex Dongs. I am the Press Secretary to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister's office, we are embarking on a series of press conferences where we will be engaging with ministers and ministries to share information with you, the public. Uh, this afternoon, we have present with us the Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, the Honorable Kirk Humphrey. You also have the Minister of Home Affairs, Information and Public Affairs, the Honorable Wilfred Abrams. And also we have the Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs, the Honorable Ryan Strawn. And they will be sharing with you, as I said. Um, and after we're finishing presentations, I'll invite you to field questions to the ministers who are present. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Minister Humphreys. Everybody's ready? A very special good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as you all are well aware by now, I am the Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs. And uh, this, I think, is a good time to brief the country, really, about what we are doing specifically for the persons we've identified as the most vulnerable people in Barbados. I would want to say, first of all, that we have <clears throat> developed what we call a geospatial map. And on that geospatial map, it allows us to determine, having put in the information, where people are located, the nature of their issues. So if a person has a disability, if a person is elderly, if a house is desperately in need of repair, um, and those things. And so far on that geospatial map, we've already inputted information for 15,983 clients from the ministry. And in total, we have 17,244 persons. So we can tell if, an, if, for example, there was to be an event today, uh, we can tell where those persons are located. We can tell the bus routes uh, in relation to where the persons are, how close the nearest emergency facility is. Those are the things. And we are moving toward this because it allows us to make decisions faster, whether it is before the hurricane, after the hurricane, before the disaster, after the disaster. The idea is to be able to get to the most vulnerable. You obviously want to use this opportunity as well to make an appeal for persons to come forward if they know where persons are, who they think are vulnerable, so that we have this information, we can put it into the system, but also so that we can make decisions. And of course, we can also then use that information to see if the person needs assistance through the welfare department, if the person qualifies for the One Family Program, and so on. So on that list, there are the vulnerable persons that we have now. The most vulnerable are the 1,508 persons. The persons with disabilities on that list are 320, and the welfare clients active that we have on the list, the active welfare clients are 8,623. The, you would also appreciate that the ministry is currently in the field working with the minister and his team in DEM to update that list. So you're going to be seeing people coming around, taking information over the course of the next few days, next few weeks. And that information we're going to use in the ministry to help uh, support the list that we have so that we have the most up-to-date list. And again, I want to make a call to say, if you know that there are people in your area who may be vulnerable, based on your own assessment, to pass that information over to the ministry. We will then go and do the assessment um, with the necessary support and update the data as is necessary. The idea of geospatial mapping, I think, is a, is a good one because on a computer system now, I can stand from my computer and hopefully one day get a chance to show the media and show you where the most vulnerable people in Barbados live. And as we update the list, we get to do more of that. It is going to be very secure, um, but the list allows us to respond before and after a disaster. The other important point that I think we should make here is that um, thus far, since we started going out in the last few weeks to collect information, we've added an additional 800 and something persons to that list. And I say so because I don't want people to think that this is a wasted exercise. If you see persons from the DEM coming around and, and so on, it is not a wasted exercise. We are actually using that to supplement the information that we have in the ministry to allow us to make adequate decisions. So persons who wish to contact the ministry can do so at 536-HOPE, 536-HOPE, HOPE the associated numbers, or at the email ps.people at barbados.gov.bb. That is ps.people at barbados.gov.bb. And so we are, we are encouraging people to come forward and to share that information. 
I think we also have to recognize that in keeping with the spirit of Barbados, we are all our brother's keepers. And, and if you know someone who is in your neighborhood who may need support, if they need food staff, if they need that, need that kind of support, to help them. I also want to encourage people if they see, for example, a situation and they haven't seen a neighbor for a long time, check on a neighbor. If you know you have an elderly, elderly person and you haven't seen that person for a long time, check on, the, check on the elderly person. And that we will be able to get through any disaster together. But it's not only about responding to disasters, it is about having the kind of information so that we can use it to empower people. Once the information is in, we have information on the qualifications, the skill sets, the skills deficit, and what areas of training people are interested in, and so on and so forth. So on the one hand, yes, we want to be able to respond, but on the other hand, more importantly, this is the Ministry of People Empowerment. We want to use that information to empower people. So again, I just want to close by thanking Barbadians. So far, the response rate has been extremely high, and I hope people will continue to share information with us. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Minister Humphrey. Uh, as you have heard, the ministry has embarked on the geospatial mapping, which allows them to identify and respond during a disaster, identify vulnerable persons, and then be able to help them as well. So as the minister would have appealed, the public, if you see members from the DEM coming around, please engage and please support this venture. Uh, next, we're going to turn it over to Minister Abrams, who will also share with us on the disaster preparedness. Minister. Thank you. This is almost like a tag team. Um, we increasingly, Mr. Humphrey and I seem to be blurring our boundaries and working together for the common good. So just to pick up where he left off, why are we doing the vulnerable persons list? One of the major challenges that we had coming out of Hurricane Elsa was in verifying the information. We we had reports of damage. We were trying to verify exactly where that damage occurred, what was the extent of that damage, who was affected, what does the government need to put in place to properly cater for the persons who were displaced or affected. If I'm being frank with you, that was perhaps the greatest challenge we had in verifying, in collecting and verifying the data. That then put us a little bit behind the ball. Um, we said we're not going to be caught in that position again. The Ministry of People Empowerment, for their own purposes, because they're the ministry that deals with the social and the welfare aspects of government, they have necessarily under their portfolio to have a running record of the persons who are accustomed to requiring help from the government or who would be in a position to lean on the government for assistance. Many of the exact same persons who would be on the list for the Ministry of People Empowerment are the same persons who live in less than ideal conditions, whose houses are among the most vulnerable, who are perhaps the persons to be most likely impacted by a weather event, a met event. So we have combined forces to actually try to put together a comprehensive list. What we're doing is we're taking the reports of the persons. We are going, our, our operatives are out. <laughs> Let me not say operatives. Cut. <laughs> We're taking the reports. We're taking the reports of the persons. Our officers are out in the field, verifying who lives in the house, um, what is the vulnerability, the possible extent of damage to that house in the event of a Category One, Category Two, Category Three storm. We're geotagging it so that after an event, if we get a report of damage to X person's house, we already know exactly where they are what the vulnerability is, what we need to do immediately to get to that person and address their concerns. It goes as far as trying to find out exactly what medication that person requires. What are their immediate concerns? What do they normally get assistance from the government with respect to? And what are they likely to need in the event uh, post a disaster? So if you're vulnerable and you don't necessarily have resources and you normally get um, drugs prescription medication through the drug service. We need to know that to ensure that we have sufficient stockpiles of certain types of medication. If your house is devastated, we know you have no chance of getting your medication. We already know that once this person has reported in that they have been affected, 
we need to start getting X, Y, and Z ready to deal with that person. This is, this is preparation on a level that we've never done as a government. So this is new, this is novel, this is entirely people-centered, and it is, made, is meant to make our life easier post-disaster, and also by making our life easier, make your life easier, allowing you to have access to exactly what you want. Where are we pushing to do this now? This Atlantic hurricane season is predicted to be one of the most active. We expect the Colorado State University's extended range forecast is suggesting that we're going to get about 23 named storms. 11 will become hurricanes. That's their prediction. And they're the one that we most normally tie our, our predictions to. And five major hurricanes. Five major hurricanes are hurricanes that are category three or above. Five major hurricanes, and there's a high possibility that something may affect Barbados. Now, although we are predicted to get five major hurricanes, what we need to always bear in mind is that Elsa, the storm that we're still recovering from, that decimated most of the vulnerable housing stock in Barbados, and that actually provoked us into being as super ready as we possibly can be. Elsa was a category one storm for a minimal amount of time, maybe an hour. Category one conditions, and it barely made category one. So it wasn't high category one, almost category two. It barely made category one for a very short period of time. And that caused that much damage. We are not taking this lightly. Now, there is a tendency on behalf of persons to not want to admit to their vulnerabilities. I'm asking Barbadians to be honest with yourself this time around and also to look out for your neighbors. If you know somebody who's in a vulnerable situation, then call in and report it. We will make contact with the person and we will seek to ascertain the extended vulnerabilities and put ourselves in a position to help them help themselves post a disaster. If you yourself are vulnerable, then reach out and give us the information. This is not we're not collecting information just for so. We want to know exactly what your position is, what your condition is, how many persons are in the house, what are the vulnerabilities of everybody in the house, so we can make the proper provisions to assist you post-disaster. So that's from the Ministry of Home Affairs side. As I said, um, the Ministry of People Empowerment has its own reasons for collating the vulnerable persons list. But I'm just explaining to you how it is that the DEM and the Ministry of Home Affairs has now come into the picture in relation to what seems to be the same information. We require the same list, but our reasons for requiring it might be slightly different. But at the end of the day, both reasons are people-centered. Now, while I'm on, while I'm on this, I, at, at the beginning of the hurricane season, we did the annual press conference and a lot of persons reached out to us in relation to um, insurance. I just, I'm going to explain something again uh, because I think it's necessary for Barbadians to understand it in relation to insurance and the risk of underinsuring your property. Following Elsa, the government made a decision to try to assist everybody whose house was damaged who was not in a position to help themselves. Because we had no preset lists, and because we didn't have a stated criteria, effectively, anybody who had damage, who was borderline, then we tried to assist you in repairing your house or rebuilding your house. That presented a staggering challenge to the government of Barbados, and we expended way more than was contemplated. That was a one-off. Obviously, the policy needs to be refined to deal with who is entitled to assistance from the government. If you're below the poverty level and you're on the legitimate vulnerable list, then we know we have to assist you. There are some people who cannot possibly help themselves. But then there are other persons who are financially in a position to get insurance. We try to do the best that we can for as many people as we can. But equally, in, it, in order for the government to be able to help the persons who are not able to help themselves, then the persons who are in a position to help themselves must actually take some responsibility 
and assist themselves. So if you are in a position to insure your property, please insure your property. If you insure your property, make sure you insure your property to the fullest value possible. What is the value of your property, the replacement value? Insure it to that. How insurance works. If you have a property that's worth $100,000, a house that's worth $100,000, and you choose to insure it for $50,000, then if an event happened and you sustained damage to half the house, $50,000 worth, you're not getting $50,000. They're going to prorate that damage. So if you insure for half of the value of the house, then they're going to give you half of, of what it is that you lost. And people don't understand it. So you run the risk of not being fully covered for the damage you sustain if you underinsure your property. So that is something I'm urging. A lot of people didn't actually understand that, so I felt the need to explain that again. So insure your property property for the full insurable value so you're not caught by surprise if you get substantial damage and then don't get the settlement that you expect right um we're going to probably send out some faqs in relation to that and do some psas as well in relation to the insurance aspect of it but i just think it's necessary for us and the media to work with us to actually help protect barbadians the last thing I'm going to say is we keep saying be prepared for the hurricane season. It is important to be prepared, but it's also important to stay prepared. I can probably assist you with anecdotal evidence um, because it, it makes the point. There was a lady that I went to see um, at the beginning of last hurricane season, and she had just gotten two big barrels for the United States, and she had all sorts of canned foods, all sorts of things. Biscuit, and this was her hurricane place. She had these, and she, by the time I got to see her, one bar was empty, all the cover was stopped, and the other bar was there pending. When I went to check the lady again in October, she had something at her house, all right? I saw the other barrel outside, so I said, what you, what you did with this stuff? Where you found the place to put it? She goes, no, I've been using it. I said, what? She goes, but I've been using it. It's near to any hurricane season, so it don't make no sense having all in the place. So in her mind, you start out being fully prepared. And as the season goes on, nothing affects you. You start to save less water. You start to eat up all the, the um, perishable goods that you're supposed to have, right? So that if something happened to her late in the hurricane season, well, she's back in a position of never having been prepared at all. So it is important, please, Barbados, that we be prepared for the hurricane season and that we stay prepared for the entire hurricane season. We are going to be putting out a lot more notices in relation to the hurricane season, what preparedness looks like, what we want you to bear in mind, um, or uh, legitimate uh, media partners, where should you get your information from. We're gonna put out all of that information so you have it once again. But I'm just gonna leave you with the last message. It is your responsibility as much as possible to be responsible for yourself. Please, all of Barbados. We're in the hurricane season now. Anything can happen. Be prepared and stay prepared. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Airbrams. You've heard it. The call, be prepared. Uh, and also speaking about the geospatial mapping, this is a people-centered approach. I know sometimes, and this is for the media, I know sometimes people think that collecting data is a bad thing. But collecting data in this case helps you. It allows the government to identify who needs the help and quickly respond. In a disaster, you don't have as much time as you really think you have. So please, if you do see members of the DM and members of Home Affairs coming around, please engage. Um, so next, we're going to move on to uh, Minister Strawn, who will share a bit of information with us. Yes, Minister Strong will share a bit of information with us as it relates to some of the preparation um, that government would have uh, done in terms of the hurricane season. So, Minister. Thank you so very much, Alex. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the press. Um, I don't think you would normally expect to see me in a forum like this, but as Minister Abrams clearly indicated, 
the cost of not being prepared yeah, um, is significant. And therefore, we want to ensure that as much as possible that we can bring people here, the government talking about mitigation. These are the things that you can do ahead of time that helps all of us to be able to reduce the impact of any significant event that may happen. So I think it is important that we recognize that as the world is continuing to experience challenges, certainly in logistics and a whole range of areas, it is important to be as prepared as possible. And certainly it is not lost on the Ministry of Finance that the cost associated with the repair effort um, continues. And we want to make sure that Beijing's are as prepared as possible in order to minimize that going forward. Now, the government has been, and certainly on, um, in the last couple of years, the government has been focusing very clearly on what we call a community risk reduction program, which is intended specifically to, as Minister Humphrey indicated, one, identifying those persons who are most vulnerable in the society, and being able to ensure then that the appropriate systems are in place in order to be able to support um, said vulnerability. Um, as it relates to hurricane season, obviously, or any emergency for that matter, the reality is that the, the Ministry of Home Affairs through the Department of Emergency Management has been beyond just the focus on hurricanes, looking at the various hazards certainly that affect communities and how we can use public policy to help mitigate and prepare um, communities in relation to being able to be prepared for said hazards. So I know you've seen some tsunami drills and you've seen fire drills and a whole set of things being done across the country to help people be prepared. And therefore, over the course of the last couple of years, we've spent quite a bit of money ensuring that our shelters, emergency shelters, not just hurricane shelters, but as emergency shelters are prepared, being outfitted with not just water storage tanks, but generators and the like in order to make sure that if something happens, that the country can accommodate um, said persons, whether in a hurric hurric during a hurricane, post-hurricane, and certainly, um, God forbid, if something more serious happens, that those facilities still stand, will be able to house persons. So we've been focused very, very squarely on that, and therefore you would have seen, we are here at the Barbados Water Authority, over the course of the last few years, we've done quite a bit of repairs and new construction actually of reservoirs across the country to ensure that those reservoirs can withstand category three um, hurricanes. So you would have seen construction over the course of the last few years in relation to that. Now, however, as it relates directly to households, and I think you may recall that over the course of the last two years, we announced um, very clearly that we wanted to ensure that as it relates to independent generation of power, that we put in place a mechanism whereby households can have access to um, generators uh, free of, of import duty as well as VAT. And we continue, and that was extended in, by the Prime Minister in the budget earlier this year, in addition to a similar uh, process with respect to obtaining um, portable water tanks and electric pumps and septic tanks in order to ensure then that households, again, um, free of import duty as well as VAT in order to lower the cost with respect to households being prepared, not just for the hurricane season, but being prepared more generally. We've seen a number of water outages in recent times, and therefore the intent of the government as part of the community risk reduction program is to try to ease <laughs> the cost with respect to households directly in relation to being able to obtain these things because as the drought conditions persist and as the BWA has to replace mains across the country, it is important that as communities um, ad adopt these, these facilities, that it helps us to be much more aggressive in relation to being able to respond and to minimize the disruption that is often um, visited because of some type of, of outage. In recent times, we've seen obviously in relation to power outages, and certainly one of the key things that happens obviously in a climatic event, especially hurricanes, is that immediately in the aftermath of a hurricane there's usually a significant power outage. And therefore the focus in relation to the community risk reduction program on allowing households to have the access to generators is to ensure that within our communities we can provide 
some measure of security and safety because once there's lighting and appropriate um, generating capacity, then that serves to provide some level of comfort, um, but, as well, uh, but more importantly, safety in relation to that. Now, in the last two years, and I just will give you some, some basic data, uh, we've seen imported 3,406 generators um, onto the island. We don't manufacture generators in, in Barbados. But both ministers mentioned data. And therefore, I, I just wish to reiterate that the policy intent is to allow as many households to have access to the generators with respect to free of duty as well as VAT. Now, what we've observed is that there are a number of uh, anomalies, for lack of a, of, a, of a better word, whereby some have taken advantage of the process and thereby we've had to put a few measures in place to be able to ensure that households who legitimately want to have access to generators can continue to have um, the access under the policy that's been, that's been articulated, but to ensure that, the, again, the some of the broader public policy things are in place. And so it is important to understand that as government is foregoing revenue, and this is not to, to, be, to be underscored, as government is foregoing revenue in relation to this specific exercise, it is important, one, that households actually benefit from the reduction in costs, because that's the purpose for which we want to be able to ensure that happens. But two, it is important to understand that most businesses would have some type of business continuity in place. And therefore, it is the program here is not designed for businesses because that's part of your normal business cost of operating. And therefore, it is important to, that the Customs and, and Excise Department um, has shared with me some, some specific information that we've, we've had to relook how we are going to implement the policy in order to make sure that households continue to benefit from the access to generators in the same way that we want households to be able to access the water storage tanks and the electric pumps because all of this is to ensure that Barbados is as prepared as possible. So in so moving forward and just, just to reiterate that households now will be able to have access to um, generators, five kilowatts up to 25 kilowatts, because the average household will need electricity between that um, in order to run um, their facility. Um, and therefore, the customs department will be working with the importers and the suppliers to be able to ensure that generators are made available within that specific range. And from an administrative perspective, this does not impact the household. This is in relation to those persons who actually do the importation in order to make sure then that generators within that range, five kilowatts to 25 kilowatts, are virtually warehoused so that the recording with respect to ensuring that the benefit actually goes to households and that the benefit is actually passed on to the consumer in a way that it is intended to be able to, to, to do. And therefore, the Customs Department will introduce that specific system um, with the importers to ensure that one, as generators specifically in this case are cleared, that they're cleared for the person to not pay any duty or VAT, but we can be assured by the person attesting that this will be installed at their residence because as part of our program of, of tracking and making sure that everything is right, um, from time to time people may have to check to make sure that this is the data that is provided is actually factual in order to make sure that the policy intent um, is, is followed. Now, I should say that anybody who's home requires a system of generation that is greater than 25 kilowatts, then they can apply to the Ministry of Finance to receive the same waiver because at the end of the day, an electrician will come to your home and tell you what size gener well, you ought to um, engage some type of electrician who will retrofit because the purpose of the generation is to ensure that households have the backup power in the event that there's an electricity loss. And therefore, the transfer switches which is part of the, the suite of the policy that has been enunciated, is part of the duty and VAT-free process where the electrician then will install the generator at your home in order to make sure then that there's a smooth transfer should there be some type of interruption 
in relation to that matter. Now, why is this important? You and I could go to any hardware and buy a generator, yeah? But nobody knows whether or not, well, as it stands now, nobody is checking to make sure that one, that actually goes to your home, and that two, the hardware or whoever's in, um, providing you the service, that you're actually getting the benefit for which the government has actually um, afforded, and therefore we want to make sure that there's a specific process in place to be able to have that verification done. So homeowners will be required as part of the process in terms of whoever you may engage to attest that this generator with this serial number is to be installed at your property. I don't think anybody in Barbados would, would find any specific fault with that so that as we are able to track the process through, that we are sure, as we have said, as we've just done the census, there were questions on the, on the questionnaire about the type of power generation that people would have, and therefore as we move forward as being able to track and see where, um, how the country is prepared, we would know the kind of independent generating um, capacity that we have within the island in order to make sure that we know that if the power goes out in a specific area, that there may be, peop um, there may be areas whereby people have the capacity to independently generate that. And this is important because post-disaster, post-disaster, security is often a very serious um, issue, and therefore we want to encourage persons to, to install the generators at their homes. These are not generators to, to do um, anything other than literally ensure that your home has additional capacity in order to make sure that that is done. So the Customs Department will be making those changes from next week, and therefore I just wanted to, to, to bring that to the attention of, Bar of Barbadians to ensure that the policy intent actually meets with, the implementation of the policy actually meets with the overall objective of the specific policy. Now, we tend to have um, water tanks are manufactured in Barbados, so that's not an issue. That would be the, the access VAT free from directly from, from the manufacturer and from the, the hardware um, or the, the installation companies, the service providers. Um, as it relates to the actual installation cost, and this is more purely a technical thing now, um, if you are getting a specific company to install, the VAT is waived on the installation of the service, on the service <coughs> itself, and therefore that is something that we want people, Barbadians to pay attention to because we genuinely want Barbadians to benefit from the fact that the government has waived the VAT, both on the purchase, either through the, the purchase or the installation part. Now, if any Barbadian <coughs> goes online, sees a generator, and imports it, they too will be able to benefit from the same process, but they will have to certify through, because they will probably bring it in with some shipping agent or something, have to attest that this is to be installed at my property and your appropriate information will be provided at the time so that in the future, as we are moving around, let's say we, as the government is moving around to ensure that people are actually prepared, somebody may come and check at some point to verify that that has indeed been the case. Um, so in the context of where we want to go, I'm, I'm satisfied that 3,400 generators haven't been imported most of them for households, I'm satisfied with that. But by the same token, we want to make sure that as we move forward, that this thing is done in a, a little more order in relation to people, one, not being taken advantage of, but two, that the, the policy intent is met. And therefore, I encourage Barbadians to, to go get their water tanks, get their electric pumps, get their generators, because our level of preparedness depends on what we do now. And I, and I think that we've done enough on our side to be able to help make it that much more affordable to do these things. And I can only encourage Barbadians to be able to go out and do that now and help the government then be better prepared to, in order to ensure that we can do some strategic interventions moving forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Minister Strawn. Uh, you've heard it here, this is a multi-sectoral and multi-pronged approach. And that shows you the, the intent of the government, uh, both in terms of enacting policy and also having action to assist Barbadians 
and protect Barbadians before, during, and after a disaster. So once again, thank you to the ministers who have presented and shared with the media. At this point, uh, we'll go to a Q&A segment where we allow members in media to field questions to any of the ministers who have presented. So just by a show of hands, indicate where you're from, because I know we know each other, but so, you know. Crystal Hoy, CBC. A uh, quick question, uh, perhaps to either Minister Sean or Minister Abrams. Minister Abrams would have mentioned that the uh, cost of unpreparedness being expensive and the fact that we would have spent way more than anticipated for Hurricane Elsa. Can either of you give a number in terms of what we would have spent for Hurricane Elsa? Elsa passed in July of 2021. We went to Parliament later that month and we actually voted $71 million initially as the initial response immediately after which we gave to the National Housing Corporation, um, UDC and RDC as part of the, that immediate response. Thereafter, we amended the, the Catastrophe Act, which allowed, for the first time, agencies of government, because before what would happen is that an individual, an individual would have to apply to the catastrophe fund when something happens. But because it was a national emergency of sorts, we amended the act to allow for the agencies to apply on behalf, because as Minister Abrams indicated, we had collected a whole set of information from, as, from the, as part of the, the damage assessment process. And I can tell you that from the catastrophe fund so far, and this is up to, just give me one second, hold on. Um, from the catastrophe fund itself, we had 24.7 million to the National Housing Corporation, um, 12 million to, to RDC, 3 million to UDC, Urban Development Commission, all coming to roughly $40 million from finance from the catastrophe fund. So the 71 that we did on budget directly immediately after COVID plus, and that's just on, this is just on repairs. Um, Minister <laughs> Humphrey will probably be able to give a better indication in terms of the cost of housing persons whilst these um, homes were actually being repaired and, and, and support. I don't have that number um, immediately to mind, but just appreciate that whilst the houses were being um, repaired, which is the cost I just gave to you, obviously there were other accommodations made in relation to temporary accommodation um, that obviously would add on top of that. And the reality of it is that, that that's part of the reason why we have to be more proactive in relation to what we're doing. And therefore, even in, in looking at how to re-engineer the catastrophe fund to be rather than reactive, to be proactive. So therefore, in the identification of persons who are vulnerable, one of the things that we're looking at is rather than wait for something to happen, let us just assess the person, recognize that the people are not capable of, of doing the repair and just do the intervention ahead of time because it makes just more sense to do that rather than wait till all hell breaks loose in order to be able to do that. So that's something that we are, we are focusing on to make sure that we don't have to spend that kind of money <laughs> again, but we have to be proactive in a way that we treat to, to having these things done. Uh, Ricardo Robert Starcom Network. Um, my question is to um, Minister Abrams. I know um, last Saturday um, we had a situation where the police um, and the, f uh, um, the hospital had lost communication. I think something happened at Flo and the Police and hospitals, PBX, as well as the police emergency numbers were down. Now, that was a national security issue right there. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in case, you know, if, let's say, a hurricane comes and, you know, chaos reigns supreme on the island, um, I'm just wondering 
um, if there is going to be any backup system communication, because communication is critical, especially in um, a time of you know hurricanes and so on, for the police and the ambulance. I'm just wondering if there is any alternative source of um, system that we put in place for the police and, and the ambulance, because since flow was down, that posed a challenge. And I'm just wondering if... No, we, we're looking to build in redundancy in all our communications. So most of the critical departments would have some contract arrangement with both of the major service providers in Barbados, so that if one happens to be down, you can um, back up on the next one. But in addition to that, we have the Astro radio service that the emergency responders communicate on, so that's police, BDF, mostly emergency persons. Then there's sat phones and radios that most of the critical installations also have. So key ministries, key ministers, heads of department, um, key persons who will respond after a disaster have their sat phones as well. Um, quite frankly, there's nothing we can actually do above that when you get the level of sat phones as was used in the, in the critical emergency. So we have built in redundancy and then over redundancy, right, in terms of the communication. Because yes, when, when we had ELSA and some systems went down, I mean, it was hell. Bajans realized how much time that they spent on their phones, right, when they didn't have access to their phones. We had to have an arrangement with both service providers to have priority lines. So you may not have been able to get through immediately post-disaster, but the chief of police will be able to get through on his cell phone to the um, chief of staff for the Barbados Defense Force or, or other ways, right? Because certain numbers were given priority status. So there's a lot built in there that people don't even necessarily know, um, but it's not gonna be a case of one service provider goes down, so everything is lost. We have, we have the redundancy at every level and is multiple redundancies. Does that help you? Yeah, but you know, in a sense, in a sense. But I, I will, I will go with that. Um, right. So I, I remember at the the launch um, that you were at a couple of weeks ago. You mentioned, um, you spoke about um, having protecting visitors and um, residents alike during the World Cup. And the question I had then. I thought I should bring it to you now, is about capacity, basically. Um, Minister Strawn would have raised the, the issue about shelters and so on. And we, may, we, we, we will think that some visitors will, will stay in their hotels during the passage of a hurricane and so on. I'm just wondering if we are at the, the, the level of capacity to house the influx of people that we expect here you know, for the World Cup. I mean, God forbid if something happens, um, would our shelters be prepared to handle you know, the capacity of people or the additional capacity of people um, if, if something happens? So what I will tell you is that we weren't caught by surprise with the World Cup. And in the lead up to the beginning of the hurricane season, we've had multiple meetings with all these stakeholders. And this is across every ministry that's concerned. So for example, one of the meetings, I chair these meetings, it would have Ministry of People Empowerment, it would have the Shelter Wardens, Ministry of Education, MTW, QEH, BDF, Police, Flow, Digicel, Latent Power, Water Authority, everybody who is concerned is there because we then make decisions that affect the whole of Barbados and for Barbados. So yes, the, it was not lost on us that we were hosting the World Cup in the middle of the hurricane season. And provisions would have been put in place Sorry, let me put it another way. Provisions were put in place to accommodate those persons. We have the, the BHTA has their hurricane preparedness plan. They have some idea of who needs evacuation from where. Um, there's the software that we have that determines where the, the greatest risk is based on how the hurricane is coming. So Coastal has that and I think it's with environment as well. So if a system is coming, based on the wind speed, based on where it's approaching from, based on the wind direction. The modeling can actually tell you where in Barbados is likely to get the worst impact and how far inland. So we're, I would say that we've never been as prepared as we are now. Having said that, Mother Nature is Mother Nature, right? I, I hope we are spared anything major, um, but 
we have we are in a position to make and take as many precautions as we can before the event that covers both locals and visitors to our shore. So all of that was factored in, and Father forbid, um, there is a plan. Uh, firstly, um, Minister Strong would have alluded to what seems to be uh, some persons taking advantage of that, uh, the, the VAT and, and um, duties waiver on generators. Um, however, I didn't quite get the details of what exactly um, that abuse of that system was. So if he, could, if, if he can uh, provide uh, some details on that, I'll greatly appreciate that. The other question, um, I guess I'll ask all three one time, and yeah, yeah. The other question uh, will go to, to Minister Humphrey. I don't know if he would have um, mentioned this in his presentation, but obviously vulnerability is a, is a, is a fluid uh, index, and basically, um, in, I'm trying to figure out in your data gathering, um, is it equally fluid to determine those who, uh, who would have come on in the short term and, and who would have exit, exited it at, 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 at some point um, in terms of, of, of that vulnerability um, aspect? And um, as the data starts, Minister Abrams, as the data starts to roll in and you're getting a clearer picture about the vulnerability of the, of, of the population, um, aspects of the population. Um, can you now give us a clearer picture as to the exposure um, that, and what percentage of, of the population is, exp is really exposed in the event of, of, of a major natural disaster? So let me, let me start with correcting a misapprehension that you have there. You say as we get a clearer picture. It is not so much a matter of getting a clearer picture because understand the Ministry of People Empowerment has always known basically who the vulnerable persons in Barbados were because they provide assistance for most persons in that category. But we need to take it a step further. It is not just the assistance that this person needs assistance with housing or this person may need assistance in meeting their monthly bills or, or may need welfare assistance. It's not just that. We have to take it even further. What condition is your house in? While you might be living in it now, I might not be seeking funds to repair it now, we need to know, is this likely to be a house that is going to be damaged or destroyed in the eventuality? Where exactly is that house? So we know after the fact exactly where we're going. We're going to check on all these persons who have been identified and the houses have been geotagged because somebody may under, be under rubble. Right? We will also know or be able to advise persons based on the severity of the storm that is coming. You are likely to be affected. Your house is likely to not be able to withstand this, and we urge you to go into a shelter. We will know whether they went into a shelter or if they did not. If they're in a shelter, we know to not necessarily be looking for them immediately afterwards. If the person has not checked into a shelter, then we can assume that they're home and dispatch persons um, to do that. So we can have a more orderly, orderly and efficient use of our resources post a disaster. As I said, we've even expanded it. So it is not just, is your house destroyed? It is, or I am vulnerable because I have this particular medical ailment. For this ailment, I need this medication. We need to know that we need to be able to stockpile that for you, or that we know your house has been destroyed, we know you're in a shelter, so we know we have to get a release of some of this medication to get it to you, because we've known in advance that this is what you might be likely to need. So it is not just, and, and refrigeration and that, yeah, whether the, the drugs need to be refrigerated or whatnot. So it is not just simply getting a number. It is drilling down into even more detail. We're not praying into your business. We don't want to pray into your business, right? But we need sufficient information that we can help you when you're not in a position to help yourself after the disaster. When everything is swirling and everybody's looking out for themselves and the pharmacies are not open and this is not open and the government has to provide, then we need to know what we're looking at being required to provide and how best we can get that to you. Where are you? Are you in a shelter? Are you not in a shelter? And how can we best secure you so you have the best chance of coming out with a net positive outcome? The data started, the data started to come in, right? But we can put people out there and we can have our teams out there every day 
trying to get the information. We're adding an additional option in here now. We actually want people, we want to give you a contact that you can call in and say, I am one of those persons. Here's where to find me. Here's what my concerns are. Or if you know somebody that may not have called in, right? Then you can be preempted and say, call in and say, look, I know this person who lives down my gap. They live in this old house, right? This is their name. This is their information. I suggest you call them because they may be one of the persons who requires assistance afterwards. So it's not just the information gathering. We're adding another way to get even more information in because we want as much information, as complete a picture as we can before anything happens. As I used to say, before the headwinds come. Before you answer the question, though, in relation to what we were address, just addressing, you have to appreciate that the system that we have, the geospatial map exercise that we've been doing for the last two years, is actually the most comprehensive digital database system that Barbados has ever had. And the system has a number of components. One would be the most vulnerable persons based on my ministry, so people who traditionally, for economic reasons, are poor. We've then been able to put an overlap over that, the people that we got from the EM. So that's an additional set of people that we're adding. There is a system that we had invested in called Encrypt. It is a national coastal risk information planning platform, Encrypt. Encrypt directly answers your question. What Encrypt does is that Encrypt is a prediction model. Encrypt takes the housing population in Barbados as it stands, and if there is a disaster, depending on what it is, if it is a flood, an earthquake, a hurricane, anything, then based on what it is, it tells you and where it is coming from. You could actually pretty much be more specific in relation to where the highest level of impact and consequentially the highest level of damage is likely to be done. And then con I, I suppose it allows you to make decisions, what you call ex ante decisions, before the event. And then you could move people. So for example, if based on Encrypt, you know this is an area that is likely to flood. But Encrypt has told you that you're getting a hurricane coming from the east. You have X amount of houses. When you look at the system, we can see how many houses. Of those houses, how many people do we consider vulnerable? We need to move these people. So that's the kind of data that we now have. We never had that level of data before. So we can actually make decisions now well in advance and be very, very specific and science-based in relation to the decisions that we make. Um, in relation to the question that you asked in terms of people coming and going on the welfare list, you know, there is, there is, the only way welfare will work is if, if we are able to move people out of poverty so that the list over time shouldn't be static. If you have a static welfare list, something is wrong. So yes, we do move some people off of the welfare list. The, the tragedy of the Barbadian experience is that we've had systematic intergenerational exchange of poverty. So um, you've had one family passing on poverty, passing on poverty, passing on poverty, and that we have to be able to break that system systematically so that, so that a mother who's poor doesn't necessarily have children who are poor. And a lot of the people who are on the welfare list would have parents who are on the list, or grandparents who are on the list, and so on. So the question is then, how do we break that? That's why you're seeing us doing all these empowerment programs, all these training programs, um, all these various things. And then, of course, when people come off, when people come on the list, um, nobody celebrates it. When people are taken off the list, that's when you might hear people on the calling program or on the radio or so on and so forth. And, and then in the recent experience again in Barbados, when things happen, you know, people go on social media, say all kinds of things, half of which isn't true, and those things are spread. But the list certainly is not the same list that we've had. Um, the list is based now on a lot more intervention. We would have done the one family program too, which is looking at the thousand most vulnerable families. And what we've been able to do is to move already some of those persons out of poverty. Um, but the hope is to make sure that they can get work. So we've, been start we've started the program, and again, I would like to flag it here. We've been asking the private sector to hire some of these persons. And once we've trained them up, um, to take them on almost, I call it positive discrimination, affirmative action. The ministry has sent a person that we've trained up give this person a chance and uh, allow us to have a genuine reduction in the list because sometimes you can have a reduction in the list that's not a genuine, a genuine reduction in the list. So we'll close by telling you a story. When I was a student uh, in London, they did a study and they asked, what is it that the homeless need the most? And they did this study in November. 
And they then determined that they would show the results and reach these people and give them what they want. And then in summer, they then gave away all these winter jackets. They did the study in December. People said they wanted winter jackets. They, then they gave the people the things in, in summer. Well, nobody in want no, no winter jacket in summer. So you had a big uproar because you have, data is only data when you use it wisely. Data, data is only information when you use it wisely. And we have to be able to use information wisely. That is why the encrypt is so important. That is why the collecting the names uh, from the DEOs now is so important. And I just said we've collected, since the exercise started, we've added an additional 876 persons to the vulnerable person list. So that's the kind of information that we want. Okay? Thanks. So just to touch on that very briefly, uh, you would have noticed, or you should have noticed, the Met Office doing a wonderful job providing a lot of alerts and information in the last year and a half, too. And that's because we, we took, well, even before, before, before that, we made a lot of investment in relation to ensuring that the Met Office has the tools to be able to collect data. So a few weeks ago, for example, um, I believe I saw a, a, an article with where the director was saying to persons in the marine space not to interfere with the drones out, out there because you would appreciate that the weather only comes from one direction and therefore our ability to monitor and therefore to, to Minister Humphrey's point about the overlay of the increment and using that data and information that is being fed in real time from the drones that the Met Office certainly has, not just in the sea, but also in, I think, the work that's being done with CIMH, to be able to ensure that the country can get access to the most, in, in real time, access to the most comprehensive um, data is critically important to the decisions and the lead time that you have in relation to what you can do and what you can't do. So I think it's important to, to, to underscore that the country will be hamstrung if we don't use as much data and information as possible, we've made some investments to be able to do that in order to minimize um, any disruption or damage that as, as far as possible that can be made. Now, to answer your question very quickly, the government absolutely, absolutely, absolutely wants people to take advantage of what we have put in place. So, that, so let's be clear. <laughs> what we do not want is for people to be taken advantage of or as a consumer, or certainly the taxpayer more broadly being taken advantage of in relation to that. And I, and I, and I say that because when we looked at some of the data, and we, there's, it's, some of the stuff is still ongoing, so I really can't say a whole lot more on it. But suffice it to say, we felt it important to be able to, to put a few more controls in place to ensure that what we set out to achieve has actually been achieved. And therefore, it is important that, that look, you know, with the best men in the world, you hope that people will, will do what's right. But there are people that often don't do what is right. And regrettably, that's where we find ourselves, where we have to, to make this intervention. But I'm, I'm confident that as we continue to get the word out, yeah, that Bajans will adopt, not just in relation to the storage tanks, the generators, and all of those things, because these are the things that are critical. So I think. Someone mentioned refrigeration as it comes to drugs and stuff. You can imagine the worst thing in, 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 a, in a, a hurricane is passing or something is passing, the power goes out and your medication, which needs to be, to be refrigerated, then you lose power. And therefore, the whole point of us trying to push people to get generators in their homes is to be able to ensure that those things, especially from a medical perspective, but certainly from a post-disaster perspective and a security perspective, the ability to generate power independently until the grid comes back is absolutely key. So I want to urge Barbadians to please go and certainly take advantage of it. And it is not really for the consumer, it is really for the people who are doing the selling that we are taking these extra um, measures for in order to ensure that the consumers are protected but also the taxpayers more broadly 
are equally protected. Well, what are the trends that you're noticing? No problem. Thank you so much for attending. I just want to impress upon you. You don't usually get three ministries or more speaking about single events. So understanding the importance of hurricane preparedness and disaster preparedness. Take that away from you. So thanks in the media. See you sometime in the near future.